Hello class and welcome to my presentation. So for this presentation, I decided to do Philosophy of Liberation by Enrique Dussel. And I chose this book because I think it helps you understand the geopolitical situation of the last 500 years, ever since 1492 when America began to be colonized. <clears throat> its relativity to today is as important as ever. Today we are facing a world escalating towards a new Cold War. And by understanding Dussel's dynamic of the center and the periphery and the relationship that that entails, which is that of exploitation, subjugation, genocide, etc., we can come to see why it is that our country, under the views of freedom, democracy, liberty, has been able to crown itself the leading imperialist power since after the Second World War. It has been able to overthrow countless governments, across the global south, or what Dussel would call the periphery, in order to extract resources and shift that wealth from the periphery to the center. Today, this can be seen in many examples, one being the coup that was done last year in Bolivia to overthrow the government, or like the few years of attempted coups that we've done in Venezuela. Um, and the last uh, 60 years of the economic blockade that has been done on Cuba. So you may be asking yourself, Enrique Dussel, who is that? Well, Enrique Dussel is an Argentine and Mexican academic, philosopher, historian, and theologian. He studied in Paris, Germany, and Israel. He returned home to Argentina in 1969 and was heavily influenced by dependency theory and the writings of Emmanuel Levinas. He was a target of violence by the military in Argentina, where he received death threats and eventually they bombed his house. Funny story, and to this day, he still holds one of the philosophy books where he shows everyone the hole that the book has from the bombing. In 1975, he fled to Mexico as a political exile where he continued to work as a professor. While in Mexico, Enrique spent a few years studying Marxism through the lens of his pre previous Semite background. Okay, so in this slide, um, we are kind of talking about the history of philosophy of liberation or leading up to that. So he says here, um, philosophy of liberation is postmodern, which now would be transmodern. Uh, this book was uh, written in 1975, if I'm not mistaken. So it, um, he says, philosophy of liberation is postmodern and is grounded in the following thesis, modern European philosophy, even before the ego cogito, um, which is the thinking being or the thinking subject, but certainly from then on, situated all men and cultures and with them their women and children within its own boundaries as manipulable tools and instruments. Ontology understood them as interpretable beings, as known ideas, as mediations or internal possibilities within the horizon of the comprehension of being. It says the ego cogito, constituted the periphery and asked itself, along with Fernandez de Oviedo, are the Amerindians Indians human beings? That is, are they Europeans and therefore rational animals? Before the ego cogito, there is an ego conquero, I conquer, is the practical foundation of, I think. And so with that being said, here essentially what he's saying is the ideas um, that, center, that the center hegemonizes are not pulled out of the blue, but of the material process by which what comes to be known as the center colonizes, exploits, conquers the lands of the peripheries. Um, before there could have been an ego coquito, there was a conquest of the periphery that sets up the material conditions for the ideological polarization of the cogito and the conquero, which can be seen in the separation of humans from humans, meaning white Europeans, um, and then everything else. Okay, so within this subsection um, of the philosophy of liberation, he says, what is at stake is neocolonial liberation from the last and most advanced degree of imperialism, North American imperialism, the imperialism that weighs down part of Asia and almost all of Africa and Latin America. He says only China and Vietnam in Asia, Cuba, Nicaragua in Latin America, and Mozambique, Angola, and Ethiopia in Africa have a certain modicum of freedom, certainly much more than other uh, 
prayer for all nations. Um, and so essentially what he goes on to talk about and what he's saying in this subsection is um, the pressure that these liberation projects are under entails that they cannot fail or they have very few opportunities to fail, which if you think about it is a big pressure. You, you, you get it right once or you don't get it right at all. Um, and that's just considering that what they're trying to do is form a whole new form of society. Um, he uses the example of a cat and a mouse. He says, the cat can make a mistake. It is only toying with its prey, but the mouse cannot make a mistake. It will be its death. If the mouse lives, it is because it is smarter than the cat. So essentially here, the cat is the empire. And what he's saying is the empire can make mistakes. They have the power and then the room for the mistake. Um, but he's saying the mouse, the, the periphery, like Cuba, like China, they can't allow um, for any, any mistakes. Otherwise, that would be the end of everything. So in this section, Revelation of a People, he goes on to say, The face of the other, primarily as poor and oppressed, reveals a people before it reveals an individual person. The brown face of the Latin American mestizo, wrinkled with the furrows of centuries of work, the ebony face of the African slave, the olive face of the Hindu, Hindu, the yellow face of the Chinese coolie, is the eruption of the history of a people before it is the biography of Tupac Amaru, Lamamba, Nehru, and Malsetang, or Malsetang. The individualization of this collective personal experience is a European deformation derived from the bourgeoisie revolution. He says the other person, metaphysical alterity, exteriority on the anthropological level is primarily social and historical popular. That is why the faces that are taken care of with beauty aids and rejuvenated by facelifts and cosmetics of the oligarchies, aristocracies, and bourgeoisies, bede of the center of the periphery are faces that like mummies, want to escape the contingencies of time, the externalization of the present, and terror of the future is the obsession of every dominant group. And by that, he's trying to say, by terror of the future and externalization of the present, it, it, it entails like every ruling class and whichever epoch of civilization, they try to maintain things how they are in order for them to keep or continue their position as the ruling class of society. There is always terror of the future, either consciously or unconsciously, that the future and shows change. And change means losing their position as the ruling class. So the next section is the bourgeoisie. And here he says, members of the dominant bourgeoisie class are themselves a victim of capital and the overcoming of capitalism will free them from the slavery exercised over the truly human level of their existence. This internal transcendentality is the exteriority of the other as other, not as part of the system. Here we see the uh, Dussel's understanding of the situation. The anti-capitalist revolution is not just something that liberates those who are oppressed now, but it liberates all of society. This liberates the capitalist because the capitalist, although they are the oppressors in society, the thing about capitalism is that the system creates the roles in society so the capitalists are still just agents within the system of capitalism. They are replaceable by anything else. They are just the benef beneficiaries of the process of production. Although they consider themselves free, consider themselves free, they are still slaves. So here, the ruling system, uh, he says, the designs of the ruling system are imposed univocally on everybody by propaganda. The communications media, movies and television through all receptive pores. Whoever resists is kidnapped, jailed, tortured, expelled or killed. The dialectic between master and slave is no longer possible. The slave disappears from the horizon or death. The periphery knows so many deaths like Patrice Lumumba, Ben Barca, Eliza Guyton, Oscar Romero, etc. What is most frightening is the certitude the dominating heroes have of representing the gods on earth in bygone epochs, and now democracy, freedom, and civilization. They are the brave defenders of being, who give their lives 
for the highest ideal before the plebeians, the barbarians, the representatives of non-being, matter, difference, the diabolical, falsehood, disorder, chaos, Marxism, in a word, evil. And here we see this in our own country. So we haven't only been, you know, the central agents of doing this to the periphery, but we have also done this at home um, within the circles of the Red Scares, the Black organizers, the killing of the Black Panther Party members like uh, Fred Hampton. So finally, to conclude, I would recommend that whoever is interested in the philosophy of liberation, you give this a read. This was a great book. Unfortunately, I was only able to scratch the surface of the book as it was so dense. Um, it was really hard to contextualize 200 pages of a book into 10 minutes, uh, but I hope I did um, a well enough job for you to kind of understand more or less where he stands on the philosophy of liberation. And so again, the importance of this book is that it helps you understand the geopolitical situation of the last 500 years, ever since the uh, beginning of the American colonization. And its relativity to today is as important as ever, seeing as though today we are facing a world escalating towards a seemingly new Cold War. And honestly, the most important thing to take away is to stop viewing the world from the perspective of the center so in our case being America, um, and begin to, to see it from the, the other lens, the, the peripheral lens, lens, the lens of Venezuela, of Bolivia, of Cuba, so on and so forth, um, and really begin to question what it is that you're being fed by the Western propaganda. Um, and so again, thank you for listening to my presentation and I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you.